and we're live. Hello everyone and good afternoon. This is the first time we meet with this Teacher Academy webinar after the Christmas break and we hope everyone managed to enjoy the break given the special circumstances. Thank you for being with us today to participate in this webinar organized by School Education Gateway, the initiative of the European Union, the place to engage with European policy and practice for early childhood and school education. My name is Marta and I'm very happy to support this webinar together with my colleagues Assi and Eleonora in the backstage. Today's focus is curriculum for, for students uh, of the 21st century. In the, in the first part of the webinar, you will be introduced to the 2020 OECD publication What Students Learn Matters. Alina Fried is an analyst in OECD's Education Skills Directorate, working on the Future of Education and Skills 2030 project since January 2020. And she will give uh, the presentation about What Students Learn Matters. The second presentation will showcase the Erasmus Plus project's team. This will be presented by Professor Gregory Macrides, President of the European Association of Erasmus Coordinators and the European Association of Career Guidance. He is currently active in the evolution of education, supporting related developments, as well as in STEAM education for the skills of, of the future. So this is uh, our agenda for today and some practical information for you. This webinar will be recorded and the recording, recording will be shared afterward in the webinar page. And if you have questions, please post them in the chat and we'll have a Q&A session at the end of, the, of this webinar to address them. But without further ado, uh, Alina, if you're ready, I'm really happy to give you the, the floor. Thank you very much, Marta. Uh, let me just share my screen. Okay. Okay. Do you all see this? Yes, great. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Elena Fried, as Marta already introduced me, and I am very happy to be here with you today and to present the findings of one of the recently launched reports by the OECD um, Education 2030 project, What Students Learn Matters Towards a 21st Century Curriculum. Um, this report focuses on how to address time lag between today's curriculum and future needs. So, um, yeah, as we all know that uh, the world is changing uh, and we are facing unprecedented social, economic and environmental challenges uh, driven by accelerating globalization and technological developments. Um, schools and teachers are constantly under pressure to keep up with the pace of change in society, uh, with teachers asked to, but also actually wanting to um, incorporate new demands such as digital and financial literacy, um, environmental issues, etc., into their teaching for their students to have the most up-to-date skills um, possible and being relevant for the future job market. Uh, so in short, there are currently many demands for skills of the future required to be taught, um, but the offer is uh, slightly outdated. So 21st century children learn from 20th century educated teachers um, in actually at times 19th century classroom settings. So reforming today's curricula um, requires quite a clear vision of what is to come, but it is impossible to predict the future with certainty um, as we all experienced uh, last year and this year. And major obstacles may arise when trying to incorporate future needs um, into the curriculum, including uh, resistance from key stakeholders. So building consensus for curriculum change and ensuring its viability are crucial parts of the reform process. Um, decision on both reforms and implementation must be timely and agile uh, in order to seize the momentum and actively involve a wide range of stakeholders. Um, it is also essential to measure the effects of curriculum renewal on students' learning experience and outcomes, which all have an impact on the length of the time lag. Um, do you still hear me? Yes, Alina, we can hear you perfectly. OK, good. I thought that my slide would not work. OK, um, and as our framework in the report, we have identified four types of time lags um, commonly highlighted among the participating countries in our project. 
So first, uh, the recognition time lag, which is mostly driven by the difficulty in predicting the future. Even uh, we can see that where countries set up foresight units or exercise future scenarios, it is still um, not enough to accurately predict the future. Um, there's also difficulty in building consensus on the types of student profiles that will be necessary for the future. And uh, yeah, developing student profiles is seen as one of the most common strategies that countries currently use, even if it may take a long time to implement. Uh, second is the decision making time lag, which occurs with a delay between uh, the actual need for change when that one is recognized and uh, the next step when an action plan for the necessary changes is decided upon, including the time required to build consensus for uh, the change. So countries share that this is mostly driven by the frequency of major curriculum reforms with frontline practitioners and teachers often feeling reform fatigue if too many reforms um, happen. And then also um, it happens because of the scope and the alignment of the reform with, for instance, uh, assessments. So if the alignment between high stake university entrance exams and curriculum change um, is not there, then that, um, yeah, that represents a decision making timeline. Third, um, implementation timeline, which mainly delays curriculum change due to uh, the lack of a sense of ownership lack of teacher agency, for instance, or lack of the understanding about the needs for the reform, but also um, yeah, fear of change and innovation and lack of training and support uh, for teachers and implementers in general. And finally, the impact time lag, which refers to the time uh, it takes for the impact of the curriculum change to actually be observed in the outcomes um, of students. So by recognizing the importance of these lags and the need to close those uh, to be able to incorporate the needs for the future, countries participating in our project um, came together and agreed on the competencies needed for the future ready student, uh, which can be seen in the learning compass 2030 that we had launched in May uh, 2019. So to make a transformative change as quickly as possible, um, the fundamental question was put forth to all of us to really think harder about the value of human flourishing, especially at the time of uh, artificial intelligence and other technological advancements, as well as all the social and environmental issues such as climate change, resource depletion, um, growing inequality, etc. Um, yeah, so what is a better future that we all aspire to create? and what kind of competencies today students will need to thrive in and to shape their better futures for them and um, for the world in general. So our um, Education 2030 members have worked together to answer those questions and co-created the vision of the future of education by identifying those competencies. And um, yeah, the learning compass was launched and the metaphor of the learning compass was really adopted to emphasize the needs for students to learn to navigate themselves uh, towards the well-being of self, of others, and of the planet as a common societal goal. And this navigation happens through unfamiliar contexts and to be able to find their direction in a meaningful and responsible way, instead of simply receiving fixed instructions and directions from their teachers. Um, at the center of uh, the learning compass is the concept of student agency, uh, which is really a crucial piece and it is rooted in the belief that students have the ability and the will to positively influence their own lives and the world around them. And student agency is really defined as the capacity to set a goal, reflect and act responsibly to uh, achieve that change. So it's about acting rather than be acted upon and making responsible decisions and choices rather than accepting those determined by others. Um, the concrete constructs underpinning student agency include sense of purpose, sense of identification, um, growth mindset, self-efficacy and trust, and trust in oneself, but also in teachers and friends in the school system and um, yeah, another construct that is um, increasingly becoming very important in light of the pandemic and school closures is uh, the learning to learn. And then um, I would also actually like to highlight another um, concept, which is co-agency, and it is defined as an interactive, mutually supportive relationship uh, of the student with parents, with teachers, with the community and with each other. So peer to peer uh, student relationships that help um, each and every student towards the shared goal of well-being. 
Um, so here we can see that uh, the PISA growth mindset measure is a good example of how such constructs of student agency matter for student performance. The growth mindset measured here as the percentage of students who think that they can do something about their intelligence is one of the best predictors of a system's performance. So it relates to the motivation of students, their self-efficacy to establish more ambitious learning goals um, for themselves with less fear of failure and establishing them as owners of their own learning practice. So um, yeah, fostering a growth mindset uh, in students is really positively related to the most important outcomes of our times. But agency is um, more than just one's awareness. It really requires the student to act. And uh, here the PISA Global Competency measures the degree of taking action, which we can see is at times as low as 55% um, of students agreeing that their action can change something about global issues. So acting is therefore really a higher level and form of student agency, which requires more conscious curriculum uh, design and targeted support. Um, just quickly going back to the concept of well-being, which is uh, central to the learning compass and combining it with learning to develop a holistic and inclusive type of education. Student agency is in particularly important um, when students explore new ideas or new inquiries where there is no solution yet and learn through trials and errors, um, oftentimes also learning from their own mistakes. And here PISA data offers some good food for thought, showing that education systems are perhaps over relying on achievement, which is costly for student well-being. For instance, we can see on the right side that uh, in Asian countries such as Singapore and Japan, we see that fear of failure um, seems to be a driver of good performance. However, on the other side of the spectrum, uh, there are countries like Estonia and Finland where students perform equally well, but with much less degree of fear of failure. So these country cases really suggest that it is not a trade off. Um, students can achieve both high performance and having less fear of failure, thus aiming for good outcomes while keeping in mind uh, children's well-being at the center stage. Um, so in our report, our curriculum analysis has identified four ways how countries and schools aim to keep pace uh, with a rapidly changing world. Um, first, the digital curriculum, which includes uh, digital content and organizational features to implement curricular elements, online materials, tools, uh, hardware, software and other applications. Um, the definition of digital curriculum varies, of course, uh, across countries and is evolving as schools start experimenting with a greater number of digital applications. Second, there's the cross curricular content and competency based curriculum which are built across uh, disciplinary or subject boundaries in an effort to really enable students to connect knowledge in a more holistic way to meet their interests and serve the society. Uh, third, a flexible curriculum, which allows schools and especially teachers and local bodies to adapt, implement or modify the curriculum by providing educators with the freedom to craft their learning uh, content, goals, pedagogies and assessments. And all these innovative uh, curricula facilitate the fourth solution, a personalized curriculum, which is one that is tailored to students' individual needs, skills and interests. And its main purpose is really to improve learning by customizing instruction for each learner, considering their prior knowledge, learning style and the pace of their learning. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic actually revealed that uh, students learn differently. And in particular, it revealed the different paces of learning along with the different learning styles, different means to learn at home. So um, personalized curriculum combined with recent technological developments could really provide a great opportunity for students to learn anywhere and anytime with currently less expenses as um, technological developments advance. So uh, you will perhaps think that all these curriculum types are not uh, very new and innovative. Um, however, under the so-called normal circumstances before uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, curriculum change towards these directions was uh, really slower than anticipated and the pandemic has created a real necessity um, and accelerated these changes to ensure students continuous learning as well as student well-being. Um, and in the past months, education systems have also come to realize that innovations are welcome, but that they're more quickly accessed by advantaged students. Um, there are good ways to be time lag, but we know that students who benefit faster from innovations are already privileged. So 
how do we ensure that these innovations um, are serving everybody and not only the privileged? And this will actually be one of the focuses of our upcoming report, um, ensuring equity through curriculum innovations as one of the most pressing issues uh, we have been hearing from countries throughout the pandemic. But uh, let's have a reality check. So are teachers actually ready to incorporate all of these new needs to shape a future ready student? such as teaching cross-curricular skills uh, like critical thinking or problem solving, which we saw as one of the solutions to close time lags. Um, as we can see from this graph, teacher preparedness uh, in some countries is lagging behind, with on average, we can see the OECD average um, in the middle, uh, half of the teachers feeling ill-prepared to teach cross-curricular skills, and even a lower rate of teachers actually implementing it in real life practice by asking students, for instance, to decide on their own procedures of how to solve complex tasks. Um, this suggests that the need, uh, that there is a need for more support to teachers to develop their understanding about curriculum, overcoming their fear of trying something new and learning themselves from their mistakes and get appropriate training and support so that students can have equal learning opportunities regardless of uh, the teachers that they may have. And in addition to this, for the integration of digital devices in teaching, uh, the answer also varies across different countries with an OECD average at around 60% of teacher readiness. Um, and you will see that here also in some uh, countries, equity remains the issue. We can see a stark difference between advantaged and disadvantaged schools especially when it comes to um, teachers' lower readiness um, to integrate digital devices and in instruction. And this has been also amplified during the COVID-19 pandemic, and this is one of the priority areas for teacher support for closing equity gaps for students' better learning and well-being. Um, in particular, the equity gaps have intensified for students who are struggling with school failure without a sense of learning progression, which may lead to a school dropout. And this happens more e easily in the online or hybrid model, as we experienced in the past year, uh, not providing sufficient support to students. And it is way more costly to get these students back into the classroom once this happens. So countries are really struggling to uh, take as much steps as possible to prevent uh, these actions and uh, school dropout. In addition, um, as many of you know, not all contents are covered. Uh, during the COVID period for all students, but especially for disadvantaged students, which gives a lot of pressure to both students and teachers to catch up. But this is leading to another problem, which is homework overload or extended learning hours, which may not necessarily support students facing difficulty in the first place. Then there are also certain types of assessments that continue to give unrealistic expectations and a lot of psychological pressure on students, but also on parents. Um, so the students are not learning and in addition to that, they are also still being assessed for what they're not learning, which creates um, a big confusion. And all of these challenges are being reported by students to actually harm their well-being, in particular their mental health and lowering their motivation for learning. Um, of course, there are ways to overcome these, which uh, we have been exploring in our multi-stakeholder setting of our project with teachers, students, government representatives, and social partners throughout the year. And these are the following. So first, we have been looking at adjusting curriculum contents, um, but this needs to be done with a careful design. When certain content, for instance, is reduced for disadvantaged students, it risks to create stigma for them, which should be avoided. And what we would need is really universal design for a curriculum, to which I will shortly get back to. Uh, to not create a stratified or stigmatized curriculum for a certain group of students. Then there is a need to adjust assessment and evaluation, um, considering the assessments in daily learning settings, such as formative assessment, also considering high stakes assessment, and uh, lastly, the national or state standardized testing, uh, which monitors implemented and attained curriculum. And third, um, there would also be a need to adjust the role of teachers in teaching, um, highlighting the use of uh, artificial intelligence, learning analytics, big data, um, and augmented reality in ways in which these uh, will actually help reduce equity gaps and help teachers support teachers, rather than widen um, the gaps even further. So keeping students motivated and engaged is actually as much uh, of importance as providing access to devices and connectivity in um, this pandemic. 
So talking about universal designs um, for all curriculum innovations that have been outlined before, uh, the universal design for learning is a commonly applicable uh, principle to remove barriers for all types of learners to really foster motivated, self-directed and lifelong learners. And these goals are well aligned um, with those of improved student agency and well-being of our OECD learning compass. With the UDL framework, designers are really called to remove barriers around the why or the motivation of learning by providing multiple means of engagement. Um, curriculum designers can make learning more engaging by adapting to learners' interests, by valuing learner curiosity and by building in a sufficient level of challenge uh, and by making learning more interactive and dynamic. Um, then, uh, yeah, designers are called to remove barriers uh, around the what or the content of learning by providing various means of representations like text, visuals, multimedia, um, adapting to the language of the learner um, and adapting digital materials and tools, which targets really the, the physical, perceptual and cognitive barriers um, that might get in the way of learning for students with diverse needs. And then there's the how or the strategies of learning um, by allowing multiple ways for students to demonstrate what they know and um, it has direct implications on how to design assessments and examinations beyond written or standardized formats. So in our upcoming report, um, we have taken this UDL approach one level further and created a checklist for stakeholders to think about uh, how universal their curriculum actually is by answering the questions you can see on the slide. Um, and aiming really for full universality and inclusiveness of the curriculum. Um, so now when looking at uh, the digital curriculum, we can see that digitalization of curriculum has just begun in many countries, um, both in OECD and partner economies. We can see that the majority of participating countries have shifted from paper-based to online curriculum, but only a handful of countries have already started the journey of integrating content, textbooks, pedagogies and assessment into a fully interactive digital curriculum. Um, so the boundary actually between content, textbooks, pedagogies and assessments is getting more and more blurred in the digital curriculum. And it is no longer just the description of what students should learn, but um, it already defines what and how students should and can learn to achieve the best of their potentials. Um, the integrated digital curriculum has four distinct features. So first of all, interactivity, which refers to the use of a digital platform as a base of digital curriculum, enabling really dynamic interactions between groups of learners. Then there is the end user participation, which involves the end user in the ultimate design, um, given the choice and adaptability of the curriculum. It really enhances the participation and shifts the role of the curriculum designers as more choices are being made by end users. So in the sense, um, teachers, students and programmers may all be considered designers of the curriculum. Third, um, there's the integration feature, uh, which integrates content, textbooks and tools for pedagogies and assessments into one curriculum. And then the fourth is um, the cross grade and cross subject learning progressions. Um, and in that sense, the digital curriculum makes some conceptual learning progressions that cut across grades and disciplines more explicit and accessible for both students and teachers. Some innovative examples of digital curricula have been out in the world for some time and some have only recently emerged or their development has accelerated in the past year with the school closures. And just to highlight one of these, that's for instance, uh, New Zella which is an instructional content platform that uh, brings together engaging, accessible content with integrated assessments. So um, yeah, assessments are directly integrated into the articles that students are reading to help them engage with the content and to give teachers directly um, insights on student activity and progress so that they can adjust and improve their learning incomes, outcomes. Um, and some other food for thought is also offered by the OECD Center for Educational Research and Innovation, which um, highlights some insights on the emergence of innovative learning environments. And here I will just note a few, for instance, the classroom um, applications. In that case, we can look at uh, classroom analytics. Um, so here classrooms that are actually equipped with sensors or cameras may become a hybrid physical digital space co-orchestrated by teachers and computers at the same time. 
um, analyzing the behaviors of both students and teachers and giving teachers feedback on the different learning states of their classroom, as well as on their teaching practice. So learning analytics can really help teachers to manage their class either in real time during teaching or as a reflective tool after teaching for professional learning. And data comes from the sensors in the classroom, learning management systems or digital activities of students, sharing really precious information on when should a teacher shift to a new activity? Uh, are the teachers losing the attention of the students? Are they engaged in their learning? Um, how do teachers structure their instruction time? And which students do they talk to and support the most, for instance? Um, looking at school and system management applications, we can uh, highlight the new credentialing ecosystem. So at the national, but even more so at the international level, blockchain applications could help stop fake degrees and certifications. They could facilitate the transfer of educational records, as well as the credentialing of small units of learning, such as massive open online courses or uh, corporate professional development provided by companies. Um, one example here of classroom analytics is being implemented by Foundry College uh, using blended learning with a platform that can help teachers to ensure and monitor student engagement in learning. Um, as we can see here, while students are in small breakout groups, which has proven to be the most effective for active student engagement, the teacher is at the same time provided with a heat map on the right side, um, identifying breakout group activity and signaling where and at what point a teacher intervention might be beneficial. So these are just yeah, a couple of tools that could help support teachers um, in their teaching. Um, so I will not go into detail into the next slides um, because we don't have that much time left. I will just uh, stop a couple of seconds here on the personalized curriculum. And here um, I would just like to highlight that uh, fostering a growth mindset uh, of a student while at the same time overcoming fear of failure and cultivating student well-being are especially important for disadvantaged students. Um, students have reported that high stake assessments have become one of the biggest sources of their mental stress during the COVID pandemic, in particular um, for disadvantaged students. However, on the other hand, it has also become clear from teachers' responses that it is not evident uh, to many teachers how assessments can be designed or adjusted to support disadvantaged students, and many note that they have not found um, effective assessments yet. This being said, others have reported uh, some anecdotal experiences that work for disadvantaged students, and many of them um, focus on assessment for learning and assessment as learning. Um, they also, some teachers concentrate rather on individual learning progressions and strengths. Others provide quality feedback and dialogues um, with teachers and among students themselves. Um, and also we have seen some adjustments on duration, frequency and the number of assessments. So quality of teacher feedback has indeed become one of the key aspects to reduce equity gaps as it relates to effective learning to the quality of the relationship and mutual trust as well as student motivation and well-being, um, especially for disadvantaged students. And all that could be part of a personalized curriculum approach. Um, here again, some examples of uh, innovative personalized curricula. For instance, Avanti, uh, together with the Indian government, has built adaptive lessons that combine videos with quiz items and guides the learner down different learning paths. Um, based on their performance and generating personalized recommendations in local languages. Additionally, um, we have found some examples of innovations to empower teachers and parents as all stakeholders strive uh, for better learning experience for students and thus create co-agency. Um, have also emerged lately to close um, equity gaps. So on the left side, DOST empowers uh, uh, parents by sending them podcasts via phone calls covering cognitive development, social emotional skills and school preparedness. Whereas Geek Teachers um, organizes festivals for teachers, including master classes for them to learn and increase their confidence in using digital devices and up to date technologies. So yeah, to conclude, um, if we are serious about changing the way we teach to really improve students' learning and well-being, especially if we want to reduce equity gaps, um, there would really actually be a need for an ecosystem change. First, a uh, curriculum needs to be redesigned to recognize that students' learning progression is not always linear and cannot always be standardized. 
So a shift towards a non-linear spiral holistic model, which recognizes that each student has their own learning path and is equipped with different prior knowledge, skills and attitudes when they start school is currently starting to emerge in a few countries such as Estonia, New Zealand and Ireland. Um, second, changes in assessments need to accompany that curriculum change. So from standardized testing to engaging uh, multiple assessments for different purposes. A linear model at one particular point in time would not allow assessing students' spiral learning progression which proceeds iteratively uh, but deeper at each iteration. And to make this happen, changes in the role of students also need to take place where students become active learners, voicing their concerns and needs, giving feedback and becoming owners of and being responsible for their own learning, um, becoming actually a co-constructor of their learning environment and thus of their own new knowledge. Um, in this context, there will also be a need of a changing role of teachers, demanding for more collaboration, real time upgrading of skills to become actually curriculum designers and be able to make their own choices about curriculum um, with a crucial importance for them to act as coaches, guides and mentors, which is something that we have heard from the students participating in our project. And finally, to monitor all of these changes um, in the learning ecosystem, the accountability system needs to change from the industrial age um, accountability model which is designed to detect errors and fix them uh, to a actually new accountability system where which will hold all the stakeholders accountable for what they're responsible for, such as connected um, accountability through networks, transparency and trust. Uh, so yeah, thank you so much for listening. And if you're interested in more detailed findings, I would invite you all to uh, visit our website which in addition to our two latest reports, um, so one, the one I actually presented on and the other one on curriculum overload, um, also provides an overview brochure, including all the background about our Education 2030 project and key findings of our upcoming reports. And uh, perhaps as a last quick point, um, I have mentioned that we are currently developing the equity report and if you or your school are implementing innovations to close equity gaps, do please share those with us um, and we would love to feature them in our um, upcoming report. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alina, for the inspiring presentation. Uh, you really gave an overview of everything that should be taken into account when we talk about the future of education through an accurate analysis of, of the data. I think there is a lot of food for thought here. And actually, we had uh, some questions in the chat. We collected them and uh, we can address them at the end during the Q&A session if, if it's fine for you. Perfect. And now I'm happy to give the floor to Professor Gregoris. Hello, hello from me also. And uh, uh, shall I share my screen? Yes, please go ahead. OK, can you yes. see my screen? Yeah, we can see your presentation. OK. Hello, everyone. Um, I. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Alina for this presentation also because it gives me an opportunity to mention also to say that uh, uh, because it was mentioned that we cannot predict the future. Yes, we cannot predict the future with today's technologies because if we go back to the 90s and try to imagine what would be our reaction if someone told us we can talk through the phone, let's say through the smartphone, uh, maybe we wouldn't believe it, but it happened after 20 years. So what will happen in, in 20 years from now? We can imagine, but uh, it may be impossible because we only know the today's technology. So if we knew the technologies of 20 years from now, um, we would be much ahead, of course. So what we need is actually to be able to adapt to the change. And that's the idea of using the word dynamic also in our uh, development of this project. So I'm going to show you many practical th uh, solutions, if I may call them, that um, teachers and Gregory's, students... Gregory's, yes? sorry to interrupt you. Would you be able to minimize uh, the window in the right corner? No, not the presentation, I mean the window of Teams. You see that? You see, uh, yeah, exactly. That's great. Thank you. 
Thank you, you very much. Reflection, huh? Okay, um, so uh, in this project, which uh, we are running in the second year now, we promised the European Commission to deliver three main outputs. One is a guidelines for dynamic and adaptive STEAM curricula, which is already published. And you can see here the words dynamic and adaptive in the sense that uh, we cannot keep training uh, people on uh, uh, new technologies because uh, by the time you finish training, the technology may change. So we need people to be more adaptive. We need uh, to be dynamic in the sense of uh, whatever we have, it has to be changing continuously uh, just because technology is changing continuously. And in the output two, which is uh, going to show you parts of it and uh, useful uh, 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 resources, I may say, for teachers, is the guidelines for STEAM activities. The STEAM, of course, everyone knows about STEM and then STEAM with the arts. Uh, we also heard about STREAM with the art for reading. And then, of course, uh, entrepreneurship was one of the top priorities in the Erasmus Plus. So we thought that uh, creativity uh, and uh, evolution without entrepreneurship, entrepreneurial mindset for students to prepare them for the for the future and the real world, it, it didn't make sense. So we had to combine it. So we we thinking about projects where uh, entrepreneurship is, is become it becomes part of it. And the other problem is that. Uh, when we were preparing and how the idea for this project came up about was talking to teachers. When we talk to teachers about doing STEAM projects, for example, they uh, we will uh, receive the following. Most of the replies would be, well, we don't know what to do, what type of projects or what type of activities to do with the students. And, and another main uh, reaction was, I am a mathematician, I don't know biology, so how I'm going to do a project with biology? So, uh, or I am a, I'm a chemist, I don't know mathematics, I don't know computers, whatever. So the problem was the teachers didn't know or do not know, still do not know, most of them I would say, how to cooperate between them and, and be able to develop uh, activities for students that involve at least two uh, uh, subjects, uh, at least two fields of STEAM, uh, science, technology, engineering, arts, mathematics, and entrepreneurship. So we had to give a solution for this. And of course, the other question was, I don't know if we have space or if we have the uh, infrastructure to do STEAM activities in the school, the way it is built it today, etc. So how can I do STEAM activities in the existing infrastructures? And the next, the next question is for the policymakers and the and, and the authorities, of course. Well, if we were to build a new school, how should we build it in order to be able to do better STEAM activities? So, in the first uh, in the first uh, publication, which you can uh, find in the in our website, in the STEAM website, STEAM.eu, and you can download it. Uh, we, we investigated uh, from a set of 500 actually uh, uh, steamer related schools in the world, in, mainly in Europe and the United States, and we selected about 50 uh, of those and we studied them in depth as much as possible and we, cre we, we, we created an analysis of what is um, happening in these schools? And in this book, you will find um, a, an abstract for these different cases. And, and of course, for each case, you see there is an abstract. And then, of course, there is there are reference files where you can find more information. So this is this was an investigation that also gives you the reference files. You can find them on the website uh, where we, uh, uh, we we have the this book I just opened for you and then we have the reference files with uh, it's in a Google Drive and you can access them and download them. There are some videos included as well. And uh, of course, uh, what do you can find here as well at this stage from output two 
is a template of a running and clear DVD plan that we develop. So we don't call uh, lesson plans as lesson plans anymore. Uh, we try to see the learning uh, as a student center. And so we talk more about learning and creativity plan for the student learning and creativity rather than a lesson. And we have a template, of course, uh, in, uh, in five different uh, languages at the moment. And, um, and uh, we, uh, at the moment, we're running also a survey for output three. I come back to that in, uh, in uh, the presentation and you can uh, uh, respond to that survey and I tell you what it's about. So let's go to the, to, uh, uh, the so-called observatory that was created in order to really give you the tool and access of uh, many different resources that the teacher needs in order to run these STEMI activities. And in this observatory, of course, uh, you can find 12 windows at the moment. One uh, is where you find the, the products of this, of this project. That's the window I just showed to you earlier. And then, OK, we created uh, several learning and creativity plans, and uh, we will uh, open one in a few minutes and to see it together. Uh, and we, at the moment, we separate them in two age groups uh, for grade seven and nine, that's uh, ages 12 to 14 and ages 15 to 18. Of course, some of these, some of these uh, are common because you can play with the level of difficulty and uh, uh, accordingly. And of course, this uh, age uh, 12 to, to 14, you can you can bring them down to uh, grade five or six if you wish and apply some of them at, at the lower grade. In this observatory, you will be able to find some links to different STEM schools in the world. Uh, some selection is there already. You can uh, find uh, STEM courses. Uh, I will mention one we set up as a KA1, of course, and uh, available and will be offered in next June. Uh, uh, here we also created, uh, and I will tell you more about it, uh, a journal for student creations for and by school students. So when students create uh, uh, results or work on a project in groups and they they uh, develop uh, 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 a text for their work, they can publish it now. So we give them a floor, we give them a space to publish their work in a journal. So this is a journal only for students. And um, then we we welcome a listing of any STEAM, STEAM, STEM, STEAM, STEAM related projects so people can find more outputs related uh, useful results. Uh, some experiments that are not put in the in a learning and creativity plan, but they are just listing of different experiments in schools, etc. You can find them here in both uh, age levels. Any uh, events coming up, like uh, then uh, uh, as part of the project output, we'll be organizing the European STEM conference next June. I will mention it later on. And of course, STEM infographics, which also are very useful uh, to really give a uh, color and, and design uh, in a way to, uh, to existing books. So we have another project where we develop just infographics. And of course, infographics to nowadays can become very digital and very, uh, you can use uh, uh, animations as well and, 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 and make them uh, accessible through smartphones, etc. So uh, STEAM infographics is what the youth is uh, learning nowadays. Uh, uh, the youth does not like to read textbooks too much. They like to receive quick and fast information. Uh, uh, and this is through STEAM infographics. This is what the world of advertisement is doing to us every day. And this is how the students want to learn. And, and coming back to, to what we saw earlier in the presentation by Alina is that we and we as teachers need to adapt to the students. We should not expect the students to adapt to us. So we need to be able to adapt to them. And we need to be able to adapt to the way they want to learn. And, and if you 
I always say that if you want to discover how to to help a student learn, not how to teach, how to help, how to facilitate the learning of a student, just watch them what they do after they leave school until the time they go to sleep. If you watch them what they do, then you can discover the best way they like to learn. And, and then you, you have to adapt your, your uh, facilitation of learning to them through uh, as much as possible to the way they like it. And of course, uh, we, we start uh, organizing some STEAM competitions. I'll tell you about it in a, in a few minutes. So let me go back to the slides. One of the solutions we needed to give is this uh, learning and creativity plan. And in this learning and creativity plan, we develop a model that we call it 18 steps. It could be less, but we propose these 18 steps as a prototype teacher cooperation between two teachers. So we have uh, the, the two teacher activities on the left and the right, and the, these uh, uh, 18 steps are the steps followed by the students, and they are embedded in the uh, learning and creativity plans. Uh, let me go, going back to the to the to the observatory just to op open here what you see we already have a, a list of uh, learning plans for example this for research service evaluation where we can have uh, we we have it in two languages at the moment that this is in english and greek and uh, of course here is relating to uh, uh, doing some survey research market research uh, 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 development. So we always try to to bring the industry the uh, into the uh, school curricula. So you will see this in an example I will show you in a moment. Uh, and the example we will see in a moment is the customized eShop, where here we have workshops, workshops also and presentation in PowerPoints and the learning creative plan. Another example is the creation of my own advertisement, a glass of hot chocolate, and how the different technology um, sciences are involved, design, etc., in all these projects, the arts, the entrepreneurial activity, the change of a river, different project, who moved the beach, uh, open air museum, chair design, science and business case studies, cement. So you can see many, many ready to use examples with worksheets and uh, procedures and steps. These 18 steps I, I mentioned earlier, network analysis, an education museum in, in our city, a smart village on the mountain slope, a guided tour, all equal or different projects for development of soft skills. So, and this is this, uh, this uh, platform, by the way, is uh, dynamic in the sense that we welcome uh, people to develop learning and creativity plans and submit them to be published. So it's a joint effort to accept more and more and grow uh, uh, the uh, resources for the for the for the teachers. Um, so uh, if I if I open one such, uh, th this is the this is the 18 steps prototype as we call it. So there are different stages, preparation by one or more teachers, where here you can see the activities, the action plan formulation of the 18 steps, explaining what to do, and then how these steps are, uh, are supported by the teachers in a, in a two-way loop, in the sense that uh, if, if students find it easy, you can give them an, another round of uh, difficulty, another level of difficulty, and bring them back into uh, optimization or, or development further of their project, and also um, uh, support them in the communication skills, so develop the communication skills as well. So to see, to see an example, um, here is one, and this, uh, this is an example of a customized e-shop, and the reason I chose this because it relates to a real, more or less, application because of the pandemic. This uh, involves technology, arts, mathematics, and, and entrepreneurship. This is about um, uh, uh, building, uh, developing skills uh, so students can develop uh, a customized uh, uh, e-shop, and this involves uh, several teachers and economists, 
uh, or a technology specialist or a computer scientist. And here uh, we see um, the different stages uh, that the, the teachers are working together to prepare the activities for the students and, um, and the different action plans. And all these are described in different steps in this learning creativity plan uh, with the available resources and links for tools, uh, examples, and they're also in the observatory. You can find uh, worksheets that you can use uh, and uh, examples. And of course, you can be creative also to create uh, more activities. And, and in the beginning here, we also explained that this would take you four learning hours, like um, uh, two, two, two pairs of 90 minutes, we suggest. And uh, these are developed and uh, this actually, some of these learning and creative plans are implemented in practice, especially this one. And, um, and here are the, coming back to the 18 steps, uh, uh, and all the uh, all the uh, learning and creativity plans are based are created around these 18 steps and you can review them and use them as you wish uh, what um, uh, what example I'm going to show you further on this is that here it was what we call um, uh, steam in life in the sense that we bring the industry into the communication to the school in this case, we brought the industry. This is a school uh, in, uh, in in Greece, Duga School in Greece, that implemented this learning and creativity plan and has created it and has brought the industry in order to help the students uh, learn how to use some technology on um, on uh, making, on developing an e-shop, some background in, uh, economics uh, uh, that they need to know what is uh, profit and and what is a revenue and all this uh, require uh, information. Here it was like uh, uh, there are three three projects that uh, were done by different groups of students. One was um, uh, setting up an issue to sell jewelry, for example. Why jewelry? Because jewelry is easy to be shipped. So they, you have to consider all parameters of developing an issue uh, in order to be effective and minimize expenses and risks. Another, another project was uh, the problem that the students had in their everyday life on when they try to find, discover different movies with different parameters. So one idea was to develop an app, uh, the idea, just the idea actually how um, uh, searching for movies uh, can be can easier uh, to satisfy the parameters. But another example that uh, almost became real, uh, it's in a good stage be because one of the students had parents who was a farmer and because of the pandemic, uh, the, the shops were closed, etc. So and they, they were not able to, to sell the, their products. So they the kit developed uh, using the the support of um, of an external uh, engineer uh, who came into the communication through uh, through through the teams with the school and the activities, and he suggested to use one tool which is called Shop Ify, and this is a tool that gives you 14 days free use. It has developed uh, because the, their parents uh, parents of the student were. Uh, it was a farmer and uh, created an, an issue of how to sell the, some Greek food uh, uh, online, like uh, the cheese graviera, the Greek honey, and the Greek oil olive oil. So you can see in all these projects, you have economics developed, you have engineering, you have computing, you have uh, design, uh, arts in other words, how to make the advertisement, uh, the, the product look attractive, etc. So. All this uh, became almost a reality, and uh, probably the, uh, the the student uh, is going to be the future seller of the of his family products. So uh, here we also needed to give you uh, tools for uh, evaluation of all these processes. So we developed an evaluation rubric that you can use in the guidebook. Uh, of course, the output tool 
we will have um, uh, 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 more details in these tables here so that you can you can see how to, to do this evaluation for competences, for project management, for formative assessment by the teacher, by the student, self-student, group assessment between the students, etc. So we provide this as well. What about quality? Of course, we had a peer review evaluation of the uh, learning and creativity plans. So what you see as learning and creativity plans in the observatory, there will be some improvement coming up in the next few months. Uh, these are some of the results of this uh, quality check. Uh, the ratings are high, but um, uh, there are various concerns and there will be some uh, improved versions in some learning and creativity plans. This is what we say dynamic and adaptive in order to be able to be able to change continuously everything uh, as we uh, go ahead, as we move ahead. And what is the next, the last output of this project would be uh, guidelines for STEAM schools. Here we're talking about two types of schools, the type A and type B. Type A is a school with uh, current infrastructures and type B is a school of the future. So we need to know how to how this uh, to t train the teachers how to do STEAM activities in existing school infrastructure infrastructures and for future schools we have to say to the authorities how they should build the future schools in order to be able to run better STEAM activities and of course we're uh, developing a K1 K1 uh, training course for this so let's see what the survey has said at the moment, this survey is open and you can also go to the news of the website and give us your feedback. So we're going to give you results from 120 people who have spoken, 81 of them are teachers. Uh, one of the questions was the STEAM program should shape the education process of the school and the classroom design, not the other way around. We have um, uh, uh, an agreement of 75% on this. Uh, so people are keen into uh, having the STEAM program and activities shaping the education and the uh, and the schools. The classroom layout should be aligned with the outcomes that the school principals and teachers aim to achieve when implementing STEAM and blended learning. Uh, blended learning includes, of course, electronic and online media and face-to-face. -face. And of course, you can see here the strongly and they agree total more than 80% uh, at the moment. This is the, the current result of the survey. The classroom should be uh, purpose, purposefully designed for STEAM, very high, 85%. Uh, the school and the classroom uh, in the school should be designed in such a way that support critical thinking, of course, multiple answers were allowed, support the STEAM teaching mode, very high, support students' assessment and possibility for measurement, etc. So they, all these are quite positive and encouraging. STEAM schools must integrate the following spaces, uh, space for personalized learning, very high. And one of the questions we had uh, by many teachers was, OK, but we don't have time to do all these things. Yes, well, the, the, the solution is digital learning when more digital learning goes into the environment and students can really learn many things through the digital learning and digital learning is nowadays connected to videos and, and learning in different pace. Uh, one of the challenges for our teachers nowadays is to deliver the same content of material in three different speeds. Imagine teaching the same content in 10 minutes, in 30 minutes and in one hour. Same content, but different speed. Try to think about it and you see that it's not easy. And this is what we need. We need teaching the same material in different speeds and even different levels of difficulty. Why? Because we need to give an opportunity for the students to learn themselves to digital learning. The very, the very strong students will just watch the video of 10, 15 minutes. The media uh, moderate students' ability will learn 
uh, the material maybe in 30 minutes and of course the Uyghur in more time. And then uh, teachers can save time in, in teaching, of course, and then the teachers will be able to work with other teachers, will be able to um, um, give individualized support, they will be able to work with the talented students, they will be able to to, to work with special needs students, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So digital learning can really give a solution. Last year we were talking and trying to convince people how digital learning was important, and by coincidence we were given an example that imagine a virus would come up and force the students to stay outside school at home for 10 months. How are they going to be learning? And this was an example we were given without imagining that the coronavirus will appear after a few months. And actually our imaginary fantastic uh, example were, was coming true. What do you see here? You see a class 100 years ago and a class today. And what do you realize? You realize that nothing much has changed. So the way we were teaching 100 years ago is still, the classroom is still the same. So things have to change. Uh, even though we have technologies here, but still we are, uh, we have about the same type of classroom more or less. Um, so what are we going to do with the survey results? We will organize focus groups with experts, experts, teachers and students in order to put in a, in a design plan what the teachers and students need. And then we will ask architects to implement the design and give us a sample future school with virtual vision, of course, and a virtual tool. So we'll see and we hope to have this by next summer and see how it looks like. So um, uh, let me say a few more things. What could yes, Gregory, it's actually yeah. would we would you be able to wrap up yes. so we can have time for the questions? Yeah, OK, I'll yeah, go thank you very much. We have the, I mentioned the journal. We have an Erasmus K1 course coming up in June. That will be in Athens, one a pilot and one in in Cyprus in next June. Uh, these are the modules of the of the of the course, and you can see from the modules uh, we consider what the teachers need. Uh, this is the I have a nice video here, but I don't have time to play it for you. 60 seconds. Uh, it's about the Euromath and Euroscience and what, how the arts comes in with math theater, science theater activity, the math factor, the science factor, all these are interconnected with STEME. And this conference will take place with the European STEME conference next June. Hopefully the pandemic will let us have a live event, but this we plan as hybrid. So we will have live and at distance uh, at the same time. There is some funding available through the project, so you can apply. You can find this on the website. And uh, there, are, there is a, a, a competition for STEAM communication, mainly for teachers. You can have a look at this to communicate STEAM subjects in five minutes. It's like TEDx in a way. Um, and also we have a journalistic article competition for students with the theme, the role of mathematics in STEAM education coming up and is published uh, and a European comic poster competition. This is for infographics with a comic approach for STEAM education is another competition is published through the website. You can find it and uh, STEAM summer camp is coming up in next uh, summer in July in Agro Cyprus in the mountains. So uh, you can find more information on this. And the, what is the next challenge is STEAM goes hybrid in the sense that we submitted the proposal on how we can do all this activity in a hybrid environment. And of course, uh, you can subscribe to our newsletters and we'll keep you informed or you can write to us to this uh, uh, email. And these are our partners for the project. I think I was fast now, right? This is it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you for sharing all these resources. Very informative and useful for teachers uh, and non-teachers. Um, before the Q&A session, one practical information, please don't forget to complete the feedback form. You'll find the link in the chat in a while. And uh, for it winners only, you can input your details in the last page of the feedback form to have this webinar registered in your eTwinning portfolio. Please make sure to save the link before we close uh, 
the webinar so you'll uh, you'll be able to to complete it afterwards but now um before um, Alina uh, leaves, I, maybe Alina, you have time to take uh, one question before you're leaving. Yes, of course. <laughs> That's great. Um, so one of the questions they posed in the chat was this one. Would you please explain us which methods have been proposed for students' well-being and enjoyment? Also, are there proposed methods in curriculum that students may use to reverse anxiety feelings? Uh, yes, um, I already answered a bit uh, in the chat, but I can also elaborate a bit on this here. So um, in our biannual meetings that we have uh, in our e Education 2030 project, um, we have like a multi-stakeholder setting with uh, teachers, students, government representatives, um, all joining us to discuss uh, crucial topics of the day. So in those settings, we have been hearing from our students um, that what they like and what they want um, for their well-being is to actually have a safe space where they can really voice their concerns, their needs, um, their dreams, their aspirations. And um, one thing that uh, really stuck out was um, the need of having a quality feedback loop between students and teachers, especially um, in the pandemic times uh, when schools were closed and when face to face interaction was impossible for students to really feel that they are still belonging to the learning environment, to the school environment and to really um, see that they're progressing in their learning. They really felt that need um, for, yes, this quality teacher student interaction and feedback, which uh, increased their well-being uh, during these times. So I think that is really one of the the crucial moments that came from these discussions from the students. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alina, for replying. Um, we have another small question before you leave. So does the OECD support public schools? Um, so in general, I don't really know what uh, is meant here in this question by support public schools, but in our network, um, we obviously have a lot of uh, public schools. Uh, we have some private schools as well. So uh, yeah, we uh, try to stay as inclusive as possible and um, the organization's aims are, uh, yeah, uh, inclusiveness as well. So of course we, we work with um, public schools, we um, make assessments also for public schools and our project uh, works a lot with public schools as well. There are many thematic working groups that our project also has and um, teachers are part of those, students are part of those. So we really try to have um, a lot of uh, a variety of perspectives. So yes, public schools, um, of course. Thank you very much, Alina for replying to the questions. Uh, we know you you have to leave, so thank you very much uh, for being uh, with us today. Thank and you. And uh, evening. Yes, thank you so much. No, and um, as I mentioned in my presentation, like uh, if there are teachers that um, have innovations that they're implementing in schools um, and schools that are yeah, experimenting innovative curricula, as was presented, we would really love to hear from them and we'll be very delighted to feature them in our upcoming reports. So yeah, please uh, That's send great. us <laughs> the innovations our way. That would be amazing. That's Thank great. Thank you all so Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank and you. Gregory, now yes. we, yeah, we have some questions for you actually. Um, the first one is, uh, what is your experience with the industry? Do, do they acknowledge the added value of taking part in the in this learning process? And what kind of entrepreneurs are interested in participating in STEAM projects? Yeah, I, it is always uh, the, the difficult part of uh, any educator to, to get the attention of industry. Uh, and uh, uh, because uh, the industry people uh, is always, are always too busy really to to, to spend time for you and uh, the way we the way we approach it uh, is um, from an other projects and experience also is we're trying to to um, to build the um, stem in industry day in the sense that uh, we we bring the industry to propose um, problems that can be solved by students so the teachers are involved in this and then we we involve also research centers and universities. So we try to, 
to make to to form um, uh, uh, like uh, meeting days for uh, two hours where um, students, teachers, uh, a university researcher and an industry person get together to discuss uh, what problems industry faces. This can be done uh, through online uh, uh, communication nowadays, but the plan was for the students to visit the industry actually and see uh, how things are operating and discuss problems. And then the students who are challenged to come back after one or two months to propose solutions to the to some of the problems the, the industry has. So this is a model that we are creating in, also in order to, to uh, train the teachers also how to do this and how to approach the industry, even how to write a message to them to, to get their attention. So it's not easy. And um, uh, the pandemic has stopped us from doing uh, some pilots uh, that we were planning to do in um, uh, with industry, but uh, we will propose uh, a model for this and we will include it in our KA1 training course. And uh, we hope that we would be able to help the teachers involve enterprises and industry in the process of learning because it is it is um, uh, it is a given fact that whenever an uh, industry person appears in, in front of the eyes of the students, the students pay attention and they like to listen and they have questions and they like to know what is happening out there. So interaction uh, between the school system and industry is very, very important nowadays. Thank you very much. And actually, we have one more question before closing. So how to persuade educators who are shocked or afraid of losing control of the curriculum? Did you overcome this challenge in the project? And how can we promise an authentic, a present learning teaching situation with students being entrepreneurs in the future? Well, OK, yeah, I understand the 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 fear of the of the teachers and we had uh, many discussions with teachers and uh, reacting in in things we we present to them. But the uh, this is the, this is the solution we provide to 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 convince them that without them, nothing of these uh, activities can be done. Uh, the teacher is the key person who is going to take the curriculum and make it a project. It's going to take the curriculum and cooperate with other teachers. It's going to use the curriculum to, to, to develop a creative activities for the students. So uh, without the teacher, we cannot do anything. And we need to help the teacher to use the technologies to be adaptive, to participate in the in these uh, developments, and uh, and uh, and this is why we developed this um, observatory because it's for the teachers, and we want the teachers to be dynamic in giving us what they develop, so we can share it between us. So it's a sharing system. Um, what was the last part about uh, your question? That was yes, um, the second part actually um, was about the um, um, how can um, we promise an authentic and present teaching situation with students being entrepreneurs in the future? Ah, yeah, yeah, and okay, of course. Uh, that's why again we we bring the industry into the scenario because the industry people, the, uh, the enterprises uh, representatives are, are the people who are in the uh, entrepreneurial activity. So they are authentic. So the teach we give authentic entrepreneurs to the students so they can see how an entrepreneur is, is working and is functioning, what are the problems, etc. what are the challenges. And when you give the students the challenge of when you create something, try to think, how the consumer will uh, be interested in what you create and how you yourself as a consumer is interested. We try to make them uh, be creative so they can create something that they are interested in it or they are classmates or they are parents 
for the uh, em the environment that and we see that the students are really very creative when you give them the chance the opportunity to be creative you will be inspired by what uh, they tell you and what they create and you will be learning from them the teachers we as teachers we can learn from the students because the students are the ones communicating with the industry maybe more than the than the, their teachers so um i um, i think the entrepreneurial activity and the entrepreneurial um uh, 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 aspect of, of any learning and creativity plan is very important. It's not applicable always, but it's very important to be to try to bring it in a, uh, a, as part of any activity or of any creation of any project that the student is doing. It's not uh, we're not looking for something complicated. We're looking for simple things and uh, with simple things we can uh, bring the entrepreneurial mindset at the right place for the students. And this is what we need because we have to prepare them for this. And I think this is what Europe is looking for to uh, to create uh, uh, skills and competences for the future people to be able to be creative and to think entrepreneurial. Um, we will try to give you the best possible feedback through our project. And uh, I hope you people will find the will find everything they need in this observatory and we welcome people to contribute to the observatory because the observatory can be a sharing system for everyone. Thank you very much uh, Gregory uh, for replying to those questions Thank and you. I would like to point out two practical questions very important for the audience before we close. Once again, please don't forget to complete the feedback form. Uh, you will find again the link in the chat uh, and um, for it winners only you can input your details in the last page so you can uh, have this webinar registered in your it winning portfolio. Please make sure to save the link now because uh, before we close this webinar so you will be able to complete it afterward. Um, one more thing, please note that no certificates will be issued for this uh, for this webinar. Thank you everyone for joining, for participating in this webinar. And once again, thank to, thanks to Alina and Gregory for their excellent presentations. Um, I wish you all a good evening and stay safe. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.